Hi everyone! So today we are going to be going over how to take care of the oh so beautiful begonia maculata. And this is a video that I've been meaning to make for you guys for a long time now and you guys have been asking a lot more questions lately about care requirements for this plant though so I decided it was time for me to kick my butt into gear and make this video for you today. And if your reason for watching this video is because you are dealing with brown crispy leaf tips all over your begonia maculata, I am definitely going to explain what could be causing that today and at the end of the video I will give you my preferred step-by-step -step method of kind of troubleshooting and figuring out exactly what it is that's causing that problem. But this is what is known as a cane begonia. Now there are also rex begonias. You can have hybrids actually between rex and cane begonias, but this is called a cane begonia because of how these stems are. As you can see, they're very kind of cane-like in nature. And these beautiful polka dot leaves that are on here grow alternating from one side of the stem than the other, which is why this plant is also sometimes referred to as angel wings. Because when it grows in that pattern, as you can see, it kind of creates this wing look to this plant. And real quick, you guys, even though we are specifically talking about the begonia maculata today, most of the care requirements I'm giving you today will apply to all cane begonias as well. But let's talk about growth pattern for this plant because it is a prolific grower, you guys. It is a fast grower and it can get quite, quite large. I am actually showing you a propagation from my mother plant right now because this is what my mama plant looks like. She is way too big for me to get in here on screen for you guys. She is just absolutely crazy. And I have propagated her many, many times and she is still just keeps getting taller and taller and just wilder and wilder and I absolutely love it. Now, because they are such prolific growers and because these stems are pretty thin, especially when it's a juvenile plant, at a certain point, you are going to have to usually assist it by giving it some kind of support. Like you can see here, I've got these chopsticks down in here and I'm using these soft twist ties to help support the limbs up on my mama plant. Eventually, and probably not too, too far from now, I'm probably gonna have to do that on this plant as well because the longer these vines get, the more they're gonna start to want to bend over and kind of you know, potentially knock the entire plant over. So this plant does typically get very top heavy as well. I highly recommend putting it in a fairly large, heavy based pot, not too large for the root structure of the plant. But even if you have it in like a nursery pot like this, I would put this in like a much bigger cover pot that is heavy so that this plant isn't potentially going to be tipping over because it's happened to my mama plant quite a few times, you guys. Now the good news is taming this plant is relatively simple and if it does get too big for you, you can definitely prune it back. They are super easy to propagate and we will be covering exactly how to propagate them a little bit later in this video. But these plants are native to Brazil, so that's gonna give you a pretty good idea of kind of what their ideal environment for thriving is. But the good news is they do seem to acclimate pretty well to most households, in my experience at least, and in the experience of a lot of people I know that own these beautiful plants. So let's go ahead and talk about lighting first. There is a lot of people out there who have been saying that you cannot put this plant in direct light. I have mentioned it in videos to you guys before. My mother plant has thrived the most living directly in front of southern facing windows. And just a quick reminder, I am in the northern hemisphere. She gets direct light quite frequently, especially this time of year. And as we move into the winter, she'll get even more direct light. And she has had no problem with that. I have had no signs of burning on the leaves, no signs of paling on the leaves. If anything, she's grown more quickly. Now, once again, not all windows are created equally. Not all windows are like unobscured by trees or houses. So it really just depends on your situation. But I do feel like they really do like brighter light. So I would try to move them into some of the brighter locations in your home. Just keep an eye on those leaves. If they're starting to pale and you know it's not because you're underwatering the plant, then that would be a good sign that maybe it's too much light and you need to move it back a little bit. I would, however, avoid doing low light situations with these plants. And the number one thing that you're gonna notice if it isn't getting enough light is that they're gonna start to look really leggy. So right now you can see this plant's got like a lot of leaves close together on the stem. If it wasn't getting enough light, right now I think we've got, I'd say that's probably about an inch and a half space between each leaf. Not enough light, that could get to be about this much space between each leaf. So that's gonna be a really good indicator if it's not enough light. But watering is what I wanna talk about next, you guys, because watering is hands down like the biggest issue I see people have with this plant. And it doesn't surprise me because there is so 
much information out there in other videos, in blogs online, just everywhere, saying that these plants need to be allowed to dry out completely in between waterings. And I'm telling you right now, that is not true. That is gonna cause more problems with your plant, including crispy leaf tips, than anything else. These plants have a very, very fine root structure. And typically plants that have super fine roots really cannot dry out, I mean, hardly at all, honestly. If you let them go completely dry, you're running the risk of those roots dying off very quickly because they are so thin and fine. So I don't let mine dry out pretty much at all. The second I see like that top, you know, even half inch, inch of soil is starting to dry out, I go in and I water it again. I find if I go any longer than that, then I start getting to where I'm seeing more of those brown crispy leaf tips, or maybe if I had just a little bit of it was brown and crispy, it starts to spread up the leaf. Now, if you are underwatering this plant, you can also get crispy leaf tips, but in my experience, when I've seen it happen, because I actually gave one of these to a friend of mine recently, and I, I did not give her the care requirements fully right away soon enough. And so she wasn't giving the plant enough water and those leaves were turning yellow and crisping up and just totally crispy yellow fall off leaf. So if you're getting that happening, that is definitely because you're underwatering. You need to keep this plant more on the moist side, but you do not want to overwater it either because fine root systems, once again, can be prone to root rot. So my best advice to you also is to make sure that you have it in the best type of soil possible. Because they wanna be kept evenly moist, I use what is my basic mix. So this is five parts of premium potting soil to one part of perlite. And I find that provides excellent drainage to help avoid the root rot situation, but it allows that soil to stay moist, evenly moist long enough for what this plant wants. Now you saw how large the mother plant is. Like I said, she's living in front of a south facing window. She is currently in, I believe an eight inch pot. And I have to water her this time of year when she's actually getting direct light probably once every four to five days. If I go even slightly past that and the soil gets too dry, then I get those brown crispy leaf tips that we were talking about. Oh, and before I forget, quality of water seems to be pretty important to these plants. I find tap water kind of does the same thing it does for my prayer plant family plants in that it causes crisping of the leaf tips. So that's another thing. If you're seeing that crisping, question what type of water you're using. I use filtered water from my fridge and that seems to do fine. Now, once again, because of that fine root structure, I do find that this plant really prefers to get really, really root bound before you repot it as well. And when you repot it, once again, we always just wanna go up one pot size. And I don't want you guys to get concerned and think that you need to repot this plant when it starts to get huge on you, like my mama plant is looking. This plant is one of those plants that what's above the soil is going to get way, way, way larger than what's below the soil. And you're still not going to need to repot it yet. And that's where pruning comes in. Like if it's getting out of control, if the plant's trying to topple over and you've done your best to tame it, it's time to prune it back and propagate it. So let's talk about fertilizing these plants next. Now, like I said, they are very prolific growers. So I definitely in the summertime, for sure, when they're growing even faster, I fertilize them once every two weeks. Now in the winter, if I do see a bit of a slowdown, which honestly, I, I don't know that I did last year, but if I were to see a bit of a slowdown, I would take it back to once a month. And I just use my basic liquid fertilizer, a balanced 10, 10, 10 in terms of the NPK, seems to do fine for these guys. But let's move on to temperature and humidity next, because humidity is one of those things that a lot of people will say could be why you're getting brown crispy leaf tips. Also though, I am starting to discover that I think temperature can be an even bigger culprit of those brown crispy leaf tips. So this plant really wants to be kept in a pretty warm environment. I would say it's gonna be most happy somewhere between like 65 to maybe like 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Definitely don't wanna let it get below 55 degrees, then we're gonna get into some weird situations where we're gonna have leaf loss and things like that. However, also super important is to avoid any kind of draft that's going to drop the temperature around this plant. Case in point, mama plant here, as you can see, is currently right in front of that window, but before that, she was in the corner by the door that goes outside. I noticed that the leaves on the side next to the door were starting to do some funky things. I was losing some of them. They were kind of getting like mushy-ish you know, just not as rigid and they were crisping up and falling off, but it wasn't happening on any other branch on that plant, except for the ones that were right by that door. That's when I realized that the nighttime temperature right now, which has been down in like upper forties, maybe low fifties, 
when we're dropping to that temperature in the morning, I would go stick my hand by that door and there was cold air coming through like the crack in that door and hitting that plant. So I'm pretty sure that is why I was having that problem just on those branches that were closest to the door. So that's why I've now moved that plant to be further away from the door and in front of a window that I know is not leaking cold air in. And that seems to be helping the issue. Now, just a reminder that when I say avoid cold drafts or hot drafts, I'm not talking about avoiding airflow. In fact, exactly the opposite for this plant. So let's move into humidity and then I'll explain what I mean about that a little more. So obviously in its natural environment, this plant lives in high, high humidity, probably like 80% humidity, and it loves it. But I find that this plant does pretty well in any humidity in my house, honestly. Now I think it will thrive more in like at least 50% humidity, probably even 60% or higher would be kind of its preference, but it does seem to acclimate well to a home humidity that's not as high as say the greenhouse or its own natural environment. Now, the only problem with if you do have high enough humidity like that or super high humidity, is that this plant is very prone to fungal and bacterial issues on its leaves. And a good way to avoid that is to make sure that you have proper airflow. So I don't mean blowing cold air on your plant or blowing hot air on your plant. I mean like just a fan that is causing like a nice breeze to move some of that moisture that's in the air around your plant around and off of those leaves so it's not just collecting on the leaves. But if you do start to see any kind of like gray spots or black spots on the leaves or even kind of a white powdery looking substance on your leaves, that's a good sign that you've got a fungal or a mildew issue or a bacterial issue going on and you're really gonna need to get in there and treat it with some kind of fungicide. And because it is prone to those problems on the leaves, I also would avoid misting this plant. Definitely don't wanna be adding any extra water directly onto these leaves. Now these leaves will get dusty from time to time. They definitely like to collect dust. So it is okay to take a damp cloth and wipe the leaves down like probably once a month just to get that dust off so that they can photosynthesize properly because the more dust they get, the harder it is for them to photosynthesize properly. And it tends to attract pests. However, I will say I have never, oh my gosh, you guys, knock on my wooden floors here. I have never had a pest problem on my begonia maculatas. And you guys know I've had constant problems with spider mice. I've had a few plants that have had mealybugs, but so far the pests don't seem that interested in my begonia maculatas. Now I'm gonna go out on a limb and say, because these are kind of succulent-ish type leaves, they're fairly thick, that the number one pest you're probably most likely to experience on these plants would be mealybugs. But the good news is that these are pretty broad leaves. There's not a lot of nooks and crannies really for the mealybugs to hide. So it should be pretty easy for you to eradicate them either just by using a cotton swab with some rubbing alcohol on it and touching it on to all of them or using your pest spray of choice. But the other thing I wanna talk about regarding humidity is that a lot of people will say that you get those brown crispy leaf tips from a lack of humidity. Now, I used to think maybe that was the case. If you've been watching my channel for a while now, you'll know that I actually took a propagation and it was this propagation. When I set up my Ikea greenhouse cabinet here in my office, I put this propagation in there because it had one little crispy leaf tip. I don't know if you can see it there. That little guy right there was crispy and I put it in that cabinet because I wanted to see if it stopped the plant from getting more crispy leaf tips. And obviously we outgrew that cabinet really quickly. It was only in there for maybe like a month if that's how fast they grow, you guys. So I took this plant back out and I fully expected it to start getting more crispy leaf tips. And because it didn't get any new crispy leaf tips while it was in the cabinet, I was like, okay, maybe people are right about the humidity thing. But I've had it out of that cabinet now for months and we haven't gotten any more crispy leaf tips. So I'm kind of leaning towards humidity is probably not your number one cause of your crispy leaf tips, unless maybe you are in just super low humidity, like, you know, 20% or something like that. But I really think it's probably other things are more likely to be the culprit of your brown crispy leaf tips. So let's talk about propagating these plants. So when you're pruning your plants, you wanna find the place that you wanna cut and you wanna make sure you're cutting right above a leaf. So right above where a leaf is, you're gonna cut it off, you're gonna pop this into water and you're just gonna wait. And in a very short period of time, at least in my experience, you're gonna end up getting those very fine roots that we've been talking about. Now, I would wait to move it to soil until those roots are at least probably about two inches long and you've got a significant 
amount of them. So I would say like if you had like a golf ball size amount of roots around that stem, and you'll understand what I mean when you do it because those roots, you'll get a lot of them coming out of that stem at once. So once it gets to that point, then you can pot it up into your soil. Once again, just my basic potting mix is what I use, five parts premium potting soil, one part perlite, and then you're just gonna treat it like you would the mother plant. You do not wanna let it dry out. You can put it right into like bright indirect light is probably where I would first start it and then gradually move it into the brightest location that it seems happy with. And if I'm being honest with you guys, you will probably start to see new leaves developing even when it's in water. That is like how prolific of a grower it is. But once you put it in that soil, if you've got the watering right and you've got it in the right amount of light, it will just start kicking out new leaves like nobody's business. And then eventually it will kick out a new branch. So let's talk about that for a second. So this plant in my experience just branches on its own naturally. Every now and again, I will see new leaves starting to develop out of the side of the stem. And then every now and again, one of those things that I think is just gonna be a new leaf ends up being a whole new branch. You don't have to do any kind of like notching or anything to try to encourage branching on these plants. When you do prune your plant, typically in my experience, the branch will just restart and go in the same direction from where you prune. But I have seen on other people's plants where sometimes it will jet off to another side. So just be aware of that. But honestly, I think like 99% of the time, it's just gonna go straight up from where you pruned it. And before we move on to my tips for troubleshooting your brown crispy leaf tips on this plant, I do wanna remind everybody that this is toxic to both cats and dogs and any humans who may choose to accidentally uh, consume it. So make sure you're keeping it out of pets reach and small children's reach. All right, so let's talk about troubleshooting if you are having brown crispy leaf tips or if you're dropping leaves. And if you are dropping leaves, I'm gonna guess, and feel free to comment down below and let me know if this is not the case for you, but I'm gonna guess if you're dropping leaves on this plant, usually there is some kind of crispy component going on. But once again, just let me know if there's not. So the first thing I would check is your watering. Once again, I find these plants do not like to dry out. They definitely don't like to dry all the way out. And that is the number one thing that usually causes crispy leaf tips like immediately in my experience. So check your watering first, try to get your watering tuned in. If you tune it in and you're seeing less crispy leaf tips, problem solved. If you know it's not a watering problem or if you try to get that watering tuned in and it's still happening, my next question is going to be, is there potentially a temperature issue going on like I was talking about with that cold air that was coming in from my door in my bedroom onto those leaves? Also, if it is in bright, bright light and you're seeing that the leaves are getting pale and then crisping and you know your watering is on point and you know there's not any kind of drafts hitting that plant, in that case, I would say you probably have it in too bright of light and to try to find a less bright location for it. Now, if you do all of that and you know it is not in too bright of light, you know you've got that watering dialed in, you know it's in a decent temperature range, there's not any weird drafts that are too hot or too cold hitting it, my next question would be, what kind of water are we using? Is our water potentially the problem because we're using tap water or whatnot? Now, I do think that if you're using tap water and that's causing the crispiness, it shouldn't be spreading up the leaf. It should just stay on the edges of the leaf like we see on like a calathea or a prayer plant if you're using water that's not ideal. So if it is spreading up the leaf and causing the entire leaf to die off, I don't think the water you're using is really the culprit in that situation. But if you know you have the watering right, the type of water right, it's in the right type of light, it's not getting cold drafts, it's not too hot, it's not too anything of those things we just talked about, that only leaves humidity. And I left humidity till the end because because seriously, you guys, in my experience, people say it's humidity that causes crisping on all kinds of plants. And in reality, it could be, but the odds of it being that versus something else are actually pretty slim for most of our fairly common house plants. Some rarer plants, not the case. But for these basic, like, kind of common house plants that we're covering, especially this one today, that is probably the least likely thing to be the issue. And if you have ruled out everything else and your humidity in your house is 50% or higher, it's not humidity. I guarantee you it's not humidity in that situation. Now, if you're in a situation where it's 20% humidity in your house and you've ruled out everything else, 
That's all I can guess is that it is a humidity issue. And if it is humidity, you can get a humidifier to help increase the amount of moisture around that plant. Just remember you wanna have proper airflow around there as well so that you don't have moisture sitting on those leaves and you're not potentially gonna get those bacterial or fungal infections that I talked about earlier. But even if you guys do experience leaf loss on your begonia maculatus, the good news is for every leaf it loses, a new one tends to come in right behind it. So you can see on the mama plant here, all of these are little offshoots where leaves are gonna start to develop. And even if you haven't lost any leaves, you will see new leaves start to develop like this. This plant is just an excellent prolific growing plant and it definitely bounces back. So even if you have a lot of leaf drop, prune it back, let it start growing again, make the adjustments I've talked about today, and I guarantee you, you can have a beautiful, happy looking begonia maculata. But I hope you guys have enjoyed this video today. I hope it has been helpful for you. If so, please be sure to click that like and or subscribe button down below, and I look forward to seeing you guys again next time. Aloha.